I'm looking forward to the incredible privilege of being able to go through an interactive study on the book of Revelation. When we look at the book of Revelation, it has caused Christians throughout history to have a couple responses. Some people are so excited about it, they can hardly wait to be able to study it. And other people virtually ignore it. Uh, they did a survey amongst people going to different congregations, and they asked them, which book in the Bible would you want to study the most? And by far, the highest book was the book of Revelation. They also did a study of pastors and asked them, which book of the Bible would you least like to teach? And overwhelmingly, the book of Revelation was the book that pastors did not want to teach. So as I go into this study, part of me is excited and part of me is slightly afraid. Um, the reason that I'm afraid and the reason that a lot of pastors ignore this book is because it is an extremely controversial book. It also has symbols that are sometimes very difficult to understand, and it also causes fear inside of us because when we read about images that are startling and frightening, it sends terror into our souls. If that's the case, then why in the world should we study the book of Revelation? I want to give you five reasons why we should look at it. First, if we take a deep dive into the book of Revelation, it will give us a deeper confidence in Scripture. Not only that, but the book promises an inherent blessing to anybody who reads it out loud, takes the message to heart, and actually does what it says. We live in a, a culture that is increasingly opposed to the gospel. In fact, the moral fiber of our nation seems to be unraveling in front of our very eyes. It's things that were once shamefully hidden are now publicly celebrated. The previously unimaginable has become commonplace. In a few simple decades, our culture's response to Christians that believe the Bible has gone from respect and admiration to marginalized indifference to outright hostility. And the book of Revelation promises us a way to be able to handle persecution when our culture is not exactly happy with us for what it is that we're teaching. The, not only that, but the book can help us make sense of our world. Churches are closed. Shelves are empty. The Bible speaks of signs of the end of the age. We get to read about volcanoes and famine, pestilence, economic collapse. For the first time ever, we can see how uh, people would possibly give their allegiance to one man who could keep them safe. Something that up until this time, I wouldn't even consider it imaginable. If you'd have told me six weeks ago that all churches would voluntarily close their doors on Easter, I would have thought you were crazy. But now, because of a virus, we are willing to not even meet in churches. The thing that uh, I think is the most compelling reason for why we should read Scripture is because it will help us to be able to have hope. If we accurately get to see the revelation or the vision of who Jesus is, it will instill a deep, abiding sense of hope inside of us. In order for us to be successful in this study, I'm going to ask you for three things. I'm going to ask you, one, if you would be willing to keep an open mind. All of us have preconceived ideas, and as we go to the book, if we take all of our preconceived ideas and all the things that we know and understand about the book and are not willing to learn anything new, we will miss out on a wonderful opportunity. The second thing is I want us to treat each other respectfully through all of the dialogue. I don't want our compassion to get our point across to override our compassion for other individuals. And the last thing I want us to consider doing is to be able to focus on the main things. At the end of the study, I will be extremely happy if we're able to give you the main big picture flyby of the book of Revelation. We're not going to be able to cover all the details, and we're not going to get caught up in all the insignificant points. But what we want to do is make sure that you understand the main picture. We'll discuss the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the mark of the beast, the battle of Armageddon. We're going to focus our attention on the slain lamb that has overcome the world by dying for his enemies. In eight weeks, we're going to do a meaningful overview of the main message. We're not going to get caught up in the insignificant details. In order to understand the book of Revelation, we have to be able to understand symbols. 
Symbols are powerful if you take the time to understand them. Throughout the book of Revelation, we're going to study about colors, numbers, animals, objects, and places. Symbols have a profound way of being able to communicate details in ways that we would normally not be able to understand. Let me give you an example. In Revelation chapter 17, it talks about the mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. She was drunk on the blood of the saints. The nations were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. There's something powerful about symbols that communicate something important on a significant and deeper level that we would not be able to capture if we tried to communicate it through any other form of language. We're going to start this week in Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, it helps us to understand the Old Testament. The problem with a lot of us is that we're not familiar with the Old Testament. Um, we have a little bit of familiarity with um, historical narratives and wisdom literature, but when it comes to the apocalyptic genre, and it comes to the books that are similar to the book of Revelation, like Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah um, and I, parts of our Isaiah, we don't have a lot of familiarity with those uh, particular books of the Bible. So, so much of what the Bible has already said and the symbols that have already been given, we miss out on because we're not familiar with those books. Let me give an example. In Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 10, um, we're going to read the very same image that we're going to read in Revelation. And in Daniel, you get to see that the hair was white like wool in 729. In 713, one was like the Son of Man coming in the clouds in the sky. In chapter 10, verse 5, he had the belt of fine gold. In verse 6, he had eyes like flaming torches. In verse 6, he had arms and legs that gleamed with brushed bronze. In 10, 6, it also get the voice of sounding like multitude. With that backdrop of the Old Testament, the symbols can make so much more sense. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, we read these words. I turned around to see the voice that was one speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw the golden lampstands. And among the lampstands, that's important that, that he was among the lampstands, was someone like the Son of Man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. Do you see the familiarity of this to the book of Daniel? And I could show you Ezekiel as well. The hair on his head was white like wool, as the white as snow, and the eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were bronze, glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, kind of like Niagara Falls. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. It's significant that the first chapter of Revelation is dominated by a vision of the one who is like the Son of Man in the midst of the candlesticks. The use of symbol enhances the experience and highlights the tremendous dignity of the person being described. John shares his response by falling on his knees, which evokes the overwhelming sense of awe and a sense of assurance and comfort in the risen Christ. The long robe and the golden sash around his chest speaks of the dignity and his completed work on the cross. The dignity is further enhanced by the description of his features, the whiteness of his hair, and the blazing character of his eyes together paint a picture of one who is able to penetrate to the innermost, deepest secrets of the human heart in a profound and authoritative way. The bronze feet, the thundering voice, and the double-edged sword combine to speak of his irresistible power and his absolute authority and his ability to protect his people that he deeply loves and cares for. The symbols allow you to look beyond the forms to the profound truth of the resurrected, dignified Christ who is both dignified and and approachable. If we get to understand the symbols and we don't get caught up in all of the details, then we'll get to see a picture of one who holds the entire world in his right hand and has the capacity to be able to speak into our identity. In the next coming weeks, we're going to talk about each of these symbols, but we're going to do it in a way where we're going to spend a little bit more time and it will become profoundly important to us to be able to see who Jesus is. 
I love looking at the book of Revelation as the final book in the Bible and the completion of the set that brings all the pieces together. If you start, you get to see in Genesis when God creates the world and makes everything in a certain way, but human beings fall. Well, Revelation not only takes and restores us to what we were intended to accomplish, but it brings to fruition everything that God intended and designed all the way along. And if you look at the picture of Jesus, you get to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the Gospels that will present the person and work of Jesus. The book of Acts talks about how Christians relate to each other and understanding how we live it out in community. The epistles or the letters are the books that we get to understand about what Jesus' death and resurrection meant and how do we live it out in practical, real ways. But the book of Revelation presents an image of Jesus that our culture is not familiar with. It presents an image of Jesus who is the resurrected Christ, who already has his glorified body and is the reigning king of the universe. And if we don't see the true king for who he is, the one that holds everything in his right hand, and we don't get to see about how the Bible talks about him in a profoundly relevant way, then we miss out on the comfort and the encouragement and the hope that can come from knowing the one who holds everything in his right hand. Each week we're gonna give you um, reading assignments. And what I'm asking you to do is to download this online. You can find it on our church web page. And what we'll do is it'll give you the schedule of things to read. We're gonna read through all 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, but I also give you several verses to read if you want to understand the historical content and some of the different symbols that will make the book of Revelation come to life. We're not gonna be able to focus on every little detail, but hopefully we're gonna be able to give you some principles of interpretation. What I've done this week is developed a handout to help you look at the four primary ways people throughout time have interpreted the book of Revelation. And you can just go to our website and download on that on the front page. And what it'll do is instead of me spending all kinds of time talking about hermeneutics and different apocalyptic genre and things like that, I'll give you kind of a brief overview of the four and talk about some of their strengths and some of their weaknesses. But today, in the time that we have left, I want us to read from the book of Revelation. And I want us to kind of see who it was written to and the way that it portrays an image that is incredibly powerful. I'm going to start with verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads out loud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, take it to heart what is written to it. We only get to experience the blessings of this book if we read it, we get it inside of our heart, and then do what it says. John, verse 4, to the seven churches, this book was written to seven specific real churches throughout Asia Minor. Grace and peace to you from him who is, from who, him who was, and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. And then he starts to give um, a few titles. I would love to be able to spend time on all of the different titles throughout this book, and we're going to identify some. In fact, two weeks from now, we're going to focus on the lamb who was slain, and we're going to get to see that the strategy that this risen Christ used to conquer the world was by willingly laying his life down as the sacrificial lamb. But here's a couple titles that we get to see in verse 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the rulers of the king of the earth. As we look at the faithful witness, what it talks about is the fact that this person, the one that reveals the future, the one that holds everything in his right hand, is a faithful witness and can be trusted with both our life and all of our difficult circumstances. 
Not only that, but he's the firstborn from the dead. And as we go and read in just a second, we're going to get to see how he died on the cross. And that was how he demonstrated his love for all time, for all of his followers. He is the firstborn of the dead, which is how he conquered our greatest enemy. And by the time we get to the end of chapter one, we get to see that that resurrected king who's the ruler of all creation is the one that holds the keys to death and hades and by the time we get to chapter 19 and then work our way to chapter 22 we're going to get to see an image of this reigning king who will be present with all of his followers and he will conquer death throughout time all the way into eternity One of my favorite phrases in all of the book of Revelation is only given here, and it's only given this one time. It's Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's in charge of the people in charge. We can live through our difficulties because we have a king that is in charge of everything. Part of it that makes it difficult for us is we don't really have one person that is in charge of everything. We have a president who's in charge of our government. We have governors. We have mayors. We have all kinds of other people in charge. Um, In the ancient world, the king had all of the power. They could do whatever they wanted. They could get away with anything. In some places in the world, it's still like that. The president of the People's Republic of China still has quite a bit of power. He can divert rivers, build cities, jail dissidents, censor the Internet without anyone questioning his authority. In our world, power is divided up into many spheres. Different people have a slice of the power. There's a political, the government arena, the entertainment industry, education, media, arts, business, and sports. And I love the fact that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth because what that means is he is lord over Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. He is lord over Bill Gates and Elon Musk. Jesus is Lord over Dwayne Johnson and Jennifer Lawrence. He is Lord of the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. He is Lord over Ariana Grande and Taylor Swift. He is Lord over Sidney Crosby, Tom Brady, and LeBron James. He is Lord over Roger Goodell and Adam Silver. He is Lord over Wall Street, State Street, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He is Lord over Main Street, Times Square, and Michigan Avenue. He is Lord over every sphere. He is Lord over every arena. He has power over every government and every single individual. One of the things I want to make sure that we do not miss is the book of Revelation not only presents what's going to take place in the future, not only talks place about how incredible and how much we can trust God, but it portrays a picture of a ruler who will one day be king because of his deep love for his people made everything right so that we could exist in his presence this is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead who is the alpha and omega let me finish up from here i turned around to see a voice that was speaking to me and i turned and saw the seven lampstands and among the lampstands was someone who was like the son of man dressed in a robe when we read through that uh, verse 17 This is the only way that we can appropriately respond to God. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. You see, if we don't capture the awe, if we don't capture this intense, amazing realization that there is someone in charge who holds the entire future, and that person will ultimately be present with us throughout eternity. We will be worried about viruses. We'll be worried about if people are not wearing masks. We will be concerned about all of the difficult circumstances we face. And what I want us to do by the time we finish this study is to be confident that someone's in charge and he can be trusted and he will ultimately carry us in his right hand. Dear Heavenly Father, 
My prayer for us in this study is that we treat each other well, that we are like iron that sharpens iron, and we don't just blindly follow what anyone else has said, but we pay attention to you and to your spirit, and we're willing to learn. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.